Boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos a mais um Labo Lectures, mais do que especial hoje, com nosso convidado, Theodore Darlimpo, pseudônimo do Dr. Anthony Daniels, e é uma honra tê-lo aqui no Labo hoje. Uh, Dr. Anthony Daniels foi convidado pelo professor Fernando Ahmed, coordenador do núcleo, coordenador do grupo de pesquisa sobre comportamento político. O professor Fernando Ahmed está dando aula agora, por isso que não está aqui com a gente, mas eu, uh, Andréia, professor Luiz Felipe Pondé, diretor acadêmico do Labo, estamos aqui para uh, recepcionar Uh, Dr. Anthony Daniels, Theodore Darlingpole, e também para ouvir as questões de todos vocês. Que bom que vocês me veem, que bom, boa tarde a todos. Gente, então, para a gente não ficar muito aqui, eu vou falar só um pouquinho em português, depois o professor Pondé uh, uh, agradece e a gente vai para a nossa palestra. Bom, uh, Anthony Daniels é um psiquiatra britânico, crítico cultural, escritor, trabalhou em vários países da África, assim como em prisões da Inglaterra, assina colunas atualmente no City Journal e foi chamado por seu editor do Orwell do nosso tempo. E no Brasil ele tem muitas obras publicadas, muitos livros traduzidos, dentre eles Os Podres de Mimados, As Consequências do Sentimentalismo Tóxico, A Vida na Sarjeta, O Prazer de Pensar, A Política e a Cultura do Declínio. Semana passada, Uh, o Renan Carletti, pesquisador do Grupo de Amadurecimento, conversou com a gente sobre o livro Evasivas Admiráveis, como a psicologia subverte a moralidade. E hoje a palestra é sobre literatura e psicologia. O professor vai... O professor, gente, agora eu preciso parar de falar professor, porque ele não é professor, ele é doutor. Uh, vai fazer a palestra. Enquanto isso, quem tiver perguntas... Por favor, podem fazer em língua portuguesa aqui que a gente traduz, mas quem fizer em português, por favor, nenhum tratado, só coisas de duas, três linhas para a gente poder traduzir. Muito, muito obrigada. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Daniels. Luiz Felipe Pondé, please. Well, I, I just want to thank you, Tony. It's really a pleasure to have you here. I mean, not really here, but with us, yeah. right? You are a real success here in Brazil. Many people read you. It's really a pleasure. I thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And you go ahead. We are here to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Uh, muito obrigado. Uh, well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course, I would like to thank you for having honored uh, me by asking me to speak to you here today. Uh, but second, I should like to admit that since I'm neither an academic, uh, ah, excuse me, I'm having problems with my computer. I am not an academic uh, um, uh, 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 psychologist, uh, nor am I a, um, uh, a literary scholar. Uh, the subject of my talk, psychology and literature, uh, might seem a little strange to you. And I'm going to speak to you as a layman, not as a, not as a scholar. However, everyone is a psychologist uh, in the sense that everyone is a metaphysician, uh, whether or not he knows it or acknowledges it. Uh, we all make a metaphysical assumptions, uh, mostly unconscious without ever having formulated a consistent philosophy if a consistent philosophy is even possible, uh, and we haven't even tried to do so. For the vast majority of the time, we are naive uh, realists. Uh, we live our lives as if we were capable of directly apprehending reality. We mostly believe the evidence of our senses. In similar fashion, we make assumptions about the thoughts, feelings, motives, uh, propensities, and future likely uh, conduct of the people around us. We assume that they are in some sense uh, like ourselves, uh, for if they were not, uh, we should have no hope of even the fragile understanding of them that we do have. We do not understand what it is to be a worm or a fish, 
but we claim to be able to understand at least some, someone else or in someone else's situation. Of course, the nearer people are to us in culture, uh, uh, the greater uh, the extent of our assumed capacity to understand them. But we also believe in a substratum of human nature uh, that is unchanging. No doubt there are some clinical conditions in which people have little or no concept of other people as conscious beings, believing them rather to be mere moving objects. But this is surely a marginal uh, phenomenon. To quote Adam Smith, who was a moral philosopher before he was an economist, uh, it, at the beginning of his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Likewise, says Smith, we feel compassion for those whom we see obviously suffering, even when uh, we have little personal connection uh, to them. Again, it's not necessary to take this as an absolute uh, law. Uh, clearly, there are people who delight to see others suffer, to accept that, broadly speaking, however, it is tr true that we do feel sympathy and empathy for other people. In summary, then, practically everyone is instinctively a psychologist. When it comes to literature, every reader is a critic, uh, if not necessarily a very sophisticated one. Practically no one, I should imagine, can read a book without thinking or judging whether it is a good or a bad book um, for this or for that reason. How far it is necessary to be a literary scholar to appreciate literature is a question that is beyond my uh, present scope. Saint Beuve, uh, the French critic, thought that it was necessary to know an author's biography to appreciate his work. Uh, Proust thought the opposite. For myself, I fall somewhere in between these two. And certainly reading the prose of modern literary academics, I gave the impression that they hate literature rather than love it. Certainly they haven't learned how to write. Uh, so starting from the premise that everyone is both a psychologist and a literary critic, I need not feel too guilty about talking on two subjects about which I know very little. I come now to another a rather difficult question, uh, both psychology and literature aim to tell us something important about human life. What is wrong with it, what it is for, how, uh, how it should or should not be lived. In short, they both aim at human self-understanding. But this raises the philosophical question of what uh, human self-understanding is in theory and what it would be like in practice. At what point do we, could we say, aha, now I understand myself, or alternatively, now I understand other people? My patients, when in the days which are quite long ago now, uh, when I was a doctor, would sometimes say that they wanted to ask, uh, understand themselves and wanted me to help them do so. Uh, I would begin by asking, what would count for them as an explanation of themselves that would satisfy them. Give me an example, I would say. Give me an example of what it is to understand yourself, the kind of explanation that you want. And it will not surprise you perhaps to learn that not one was ever able to answer this question, either about themselves or about anybody else. Now it is true that in a certain very in certain very limited circumstances, one can explain behavior in a perfectly satisfactory way. That is to say, in a way which itself does not call for yet further explanations of the behavior in the first place. For example, in the hospital in which I worked, elderly people would sometimes start to behave in an extremely strange way that was unusual for them. 
and we would discover a biochemical derangement in their blood, which when we corrected it, would cure them of their strange behavior. No further explanation of their strange behavior was necessary, though of course we also sought for the causes of the biochemical derangement and removed it if we could. However, this is a peripheral human experience rather than a central one. And while there are no doubt some enthusiasts who believe or hope that one day all human behavior whatsoever will be similarly explicable, it is my belief that this belief, or is it a threat, uh, will never be fulfilled. Man is a creator of meaning, and I do not think that meaning will ever be susceptible to a purely physicalist explanation. This being so, uh, if I am right, man will always remain a mystery to man, though he will forever uh, continue to keep trying to find the key uh, to his mystery. And if the past is anything to go by, he will from time to time claim to have found it. But if the kind of total understanding of ourselves that various philosophical and psychological systems such as Marxism, Freudianism, behaviorism, etc., have claimed, uh, will continue to elude us. We will never get the total explanation. This does not mean that we are doomed to utter and complete incomprehension of one another. And literature is one way of achieving or at least widening our comprehension. Now, I hope you will forgive me if I use examples from English literature and especially from Shakespeare. Uh, I do this not because no other literature could illustrate what I have to say, but because I'm English. Uh, and good literature, uh, and even quite bad literature, uh, would do as well. Bad literature, it's worth studying bad literature sometimes to know what good literature is. Uh, the same goes for art, incidentally. It's worth looking at bad art in order to know what good art is. Well, I begin uh, a sonnet with a sonnet by Shakespeare, uh, number 138. The interpretation of Shakespeare's sonnets, which were first published as a collection in 1609, has given rise to an immense literature. You could fill an entire library with books about Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, and uh, questions are who he wrote them for, uh, what they mean, who, um, and so on. And, and scholars, are always convinced that they have found the answer uh, and that all other scholars have uh, mistaken the answer. But it is clear that uh, the sonnets are in some sense autobiographical. That is to say, they reflect and arise from Shakespeare's own experience in a way that none of his other works arises from his own direct experience. However, like all great art, they are not only particular and individual, but if not quite universal. Uh, I hesitate to claim that they are universal because unconnect, uh, uncontacted Indians, for example, in the rainforests of the Amazon would uh, not necessarily respond to a translation of Shakespeare's sonnets if they were given to them. Um, they at any rate express things that can mean something to large numbers of people over at least several centuries. Now, I know that you or all people who are watching this uh, speak uh, English very well, uh, but still it is not your mother tongue. And Shakespeare is sometimes difficult even uh, for native speakers of English, especially nowadays with our level of education. So I shall read the poem uh, very slowly for your better comprehension uh, at, before I remark on its psychological interest. And for an English speaker, this poem is very beautiful. Uh, when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, that she may think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's full subtleties. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best, simply I credit her false speaking tongue 
on both sides thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? O oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age in love loves not to have age years told. Therefore I lie with her and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. Well, anyone who reads this poem, uh, which incidentally was first published in 1599, will realize at once that it did not need Freud, born a quarter of a millennium later, or indeed anybody else, to inform us that the human mind was a complex instrument and far from straightforward. The first two lines, when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, are sufficient to tell us that the human mind does not operate by logic alone, and that there is such a thing as the will to believe, and that we are thereby capable of believing something that we know to be false. Cognitive dissonance is neither a new thing nor a new discovery, and Shakespeare understood this by the examination of his own mind. I repeat, almost every critic believes that his sonnets arise from his personal experience, in this case, the love of a mistress. He believes his mistress's falsehood because he does not want her to think that he is experienced in the game of love and therefore that he is young, even though he is not young and that she may think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties. In fact, he is appealing to her own capacity for cognitive dissonance too. She thinks him young, though she knows perfectly well that he is not young. Because, as he says, his days are past the best. And thus, by both sides is truth, is simple truth suppressed. Why is this game played? And why is it necessary to play such a game at all? Why does she not tell him the truth? And why does he not tell her the truth? It is because a relationship of love, at any rate, this particular relationship of love, cannot survive too much literal mindedness uh, or truth telling complete spilling out of what is in uh, the lover's minds. The simple truth must be suppressed. For as the poet T.S. Eliot said, uh, more than three centuries later, humankind cannot bear very much reality. The continuation of love requires that we overlook much, uh, uh, that we believe what is false and disbelieve what is true. Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. That is to say, in appearing to believe what is known not to be true. And when you appear to believe something for long enough, it actually becomes true uh, for you. In that way, love may persist. It is lies that allows uh, Shakespeare to continue to lie with, that is to say, sleep with his lover. And these untruths flatter them both. Needless to say, this is very much against the idea that we should at all times be honest, open, and authentic in our dealings with each other. Again, Shakespeare was not trying to enumerate an invariable uh, universal scientific law about human relations. He is not claiming that all love affairs must invariably be as they are in this poem. But when he says love's best habit, whether habit in the sense of clothes, habit uh, is a form of dress, or in the sense of repeated manner or a repeated manner of behaving, he is implying that he is not speaking of his own situation alone, but that of many other people in a similar uh, situation. In a different place in his oeuvre, Shakespeare makes a similar but not identical point. Or perhaps I should say that he allows one of his characters to do so, because of course it would be an elementary mistake to identify the author with his characters. 
especially in the case of Shakespeare, because there are so many characters that he appears to understand from the inside, as it were. In King Lear, the old king decides to abdicate in favor of his uh, three daughters, between whom he proposes to divide his kingdom equally. But before he does so, he asks his daughters to say how much they love him. The first two daughters, Goneril and Regan, who of course turn out to be evil, uh, respond with eloquent but flowery speeches proclaiming their deep love, while Cordelia simply replies that she loves him as it is her duty to love him as a daughter. King Lear takes the contrast between the grandiloquence of Goneril and Regan and the plain speaking Cordelia at face value and assumes that Goneril and Regan uh, love him incomparably more than does Cordelia because they say so. He therefore divides the kingdom leaving out Cordelia from which foolish action the whole of the tragedy, uh, following tragedy ensues. But before he takes his disastrous action, his close friend and advisor, the Earl of Kent, tells him to beware. He says, the, the youngest daughter does not love thee least, nor are, they, uh, nor are those empty hearted whose sound reverbs no hollowness. These lines contain a wealth of meaning, suggest and are not the only guides uh, to a person's true thoughts, feelings, and intentions. This, of course, is one possible reason why the recent opinion polls got the American election so wrong, though, of course, there are other possible reasons why they got them wrong. That language is necessary for the enunciation of truths does not mean that it is sufficient for the enunciation of truths. Lear commits the very fault that Thomas Hobbes warns against. For words, says Hobbes, are wise men's counters. They do but reckon by them, but they are the money of fools. Kent warns Lear, and I think all of us, if we reflect on what he says, not only that words can deceive, but that true emotions are not necessarily proportional to the extravagance with which uh, they are expressed. And while I cannot uh, speak for Brazil, I can say that in my own country, this lesson has been entirely forgotten. Uh, he is thought to feel most deeply who displays most emotion. Not surprisingly, perhaps, this sets up a kind of arms race of emotional expression in which, for example, he who expresses the most strong outrage is thought to be the most deeply attached to justice. I don't know whether this phenomenon has yet reached Brazil, but it's certainly very prevalent in Britain and America. Well, attending to a few lines of what the Earl of Kent says to King Lear might save us uh, from this dangerous error. One of the extraordinary things about Shakespeare I was going to say uniquely extraordinary, but of course that would be an inflated claim because I can't claim to have read uh, uh, any more than an infinitesimal part of the world's literature, is that he is able to put us in the position of an enormous range of people in situations that we have never ourselves experienced and never will experience. One of the things that he can do is to make us sympath sympathize deeply with characters who are not wholly admirable. The other day, I passed a large uh, graffito in Paris, uh, which said that victims are never to blame. In other words, that the human world is divided morally into immaculate victims and vicious or vile perpetrators. And everyone in any situation where wrong is done is either the one or the other. But, Shakespeare undermines this Manichaean uh, view. In Richard, the, uh, in Richard II, for example, the king, Richard II, 
is deposed and his throne is usurped by the man who becomes his successor. He is Henry Bolingbroke, later to become Henry IV. Shakespeare does not portray Richard as a good or as a wise man, but on the contrary, as a rather weak, vain, foolish, self-satisfied and frivolous one. His wrongful disposition, uh, deposition from the throne, however, brings in its train the civil war that was to last in England for many decades. But from my peasant present point of view, what is interesting is that Shakespeare is able to transform a man for whom we have no particular liking or admiration into a man for whom we feel the greatest sympathy. We feel by the end of his great speeches, uh, we know what it is to have fallen from an eminent position into disgrace and utter powerlessness, even though, of course, <laughs> Most of us have uh, never risen so high and therefore cannot fall so far. One of his speeches after his downfall begins, of comfort no man speak. This line is, is significant in itself, for what it suggests is something that modern man, or at least people in Britain anyway, my patients, are very reluctant to accept, namely that there are some griefs so deep and wounding that they are beyond the comfort that others can give. We prefer to believe instead that for every grief, there is an equal and opposite procedure or form of words that will necessarily assuage it. And of course, it makes things worse because when there isn't such an, uh, uh, an assuaging uh, procedure, uh, we, um, uh, we feel all the worse. It is, of course, a rather shallow viewpoint. Some griefs are too deep for words, which is not the same as saying that time can never heal, at least to an extent. Seemingly in contradiction to this, however, is what Richard himself uh, says immediately after uh, he has told us that his grief lies too deep for words. He then tells us what his grief is. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills and yet not so, for what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground, our lands, our lives and all our Bolingbrooks and nothing can we call our own but death. And that small model of the barren earth, which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed. Some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, and feared, be feared and killed with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh, which walls about our life, were brass impregnable, and humoured thus, comes at the last, and with a little pin, bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends, subject well, in this great speech, I, I hope that you can follow at least some of it. Um, I, I hope you derived something from it, uh, even if you didn't follow it or didn't understand it fully the first time round. We appreciate two great lessons, the ultimate vanity of power and position and the existential unity of mankind, insofar as all mankind has needs in common and we are all destined to die. 
how can you say to me, I am a king? When I actually, I am the same as you and need original. But as the great 18th century essayist uh, Samuel Johnson said, we need more often to be reminded than informed in order to live well. The difficulty is not, not that we are ignorant of it, but that we find it difficult to put our knowledge into practice. She is, of course, a speech of the most utter despair, uh, that of a king who has been deposed, has lost everything and is soon to be killed killed is consolatory rather than depressing. It helps us to reconcile us to our own existential situation and not to suppose that there is some perfect solution to the limitations of life because those limitations are permanent. In quite another play by Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, there is likewise a speech that invokes the existential unity of mankind which Shakespeare puts in the mouth of Shylock. Shakespeare cannot have met many uh, Jews since there were very few in England in his time, though it's possible that he might have met some if he traveled. And indeed, one of the most delightful and useless of academic pastimes is speculation on his life. It's delightful precisely because it remains inconclusive no matter how much learning is expended on it. Nevertheless, uh, Shakespeare intuited brilliantly as from the inside what it is like to be subjected to blind prejudice and hatred. Of his enemy Antonio, he says, he hath disgraced me, laughed at my losses, mocked my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies. And what's the reason? I am a Jew. Then Shylock utters the wor words which, uh, John, uh, which the critic John Grove said, quite rightly in my opinion, do not lose their power even after they have been repeated a hundred times. Hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed cooled by the same winter do we not bleed if you tickle us do we not laugh if you poison us do we not die and if you wrong apart from the eloquence of these words the greatness of Shakespeare is that he puts them into the mouth of a character who is not wholly admirable or sympathetic in himself in other words that the argument stands by itself and does not depend on the quality of the man uttering it. More than four centuries later in the United States, a violent thug called George Floyd was actually represented as an angel uh, because he had been wrongfully killed by a policeman. Oral sophistication or understanding since Shakespeare. The wrongfulness of the killing of George Floyd had nothing to do with his moral quality as a person, just as Shylock's appeal to the unity of mankind has nothing to do otherwise. The fact that he is in important respects an unpleasant character does not reduce the force of his words. Shakespeare provides us with a wonderful example of rationalization in the case of Falstaff. Falstaff is the fat knight raptor of Prince Hal, Henry the fourth's son, and later. The curious thing about Sir John Falstaff is that we love him, though it is difficult to think of a single moral virtue that he possesses. For Well,
trustworthy, cowardly, that he enhances life. Before a battle, uh, Falstaff justifies his forthcoming cowardice in a way with which we are all uh, familiar if we stop to think about it. His technique is to argue if not actually outright vice. Uh, knowing that he is a coward can honor set a leg, no, or an arm, no, or take away the grief of a wound, no. Honor hath no skill in surgery then, no. What is in that word honor? What is that honor? A trim reckoning. By a trim reckoning, he means uh, good reasoning. Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday. Doth he feel it? Doth he, does, he, um, does he feel the honour that he's, he's exhibited? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then. Yea, to the dead. But will it an honourable man? Therefore I'll none of it. Honour is a mere scutcheon, that is to say, an emblem. And so I think it must be difficult probably for you to understand it fully. Falstaff shows himself to be a good utilitarian. Honour is of no use if it does not give good practical advice results to for surgery. The person who uh, is honorable is likely to end up dead in a situation of battle. Uh, and if so, will derive no benefit from his own honor. His reputation for honor is not likely to last long either because people will soon start to criticize him and deny that he was a good person. For in the Anglo-Saxon um, We have to stop a little bit, Dr. Anthony, because the internet... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh -uh. Huh. I th the internet just stopped hear? for the last five minutes. It has been just uh, up and down. So can you come back oh, to... Dear. Yeah, yeah. We have been listening to the, right? to the scenes. I think now, now it's all right, yeah. Now it's all right. So where shall I begin? No, <laughs> sure. uh, 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 your talk about the honorable and quoting from him, the yes. Prince Harry and King Henry, okay. it was okay. That was all right. Yeah. So uh, I will say then, in this speech, uh, Falstaff shows himself to be a good utilitarian. Uh, honor is of no use if it does not give good practical results to him who is honorable. Honor, honor says Falstaff, is no good for surgery. The person who is honorable is likely to end up dead. And if so, will derive benefit from his own honor his reputation people will soon start to criticize him and deny that he was ever a good person and this is of particular relevance today uh, because in the anglo-saxon world i don't know whether it's come to brazil or whether it will ever come to brazil we are busy pulling down the statues and besmirching the reputations of heroes because they were not wholly consonant with our current scale of values, uh, which of course we assume will uh, remain permanent. Uh, we have finally got the true scale of values. To give just one example, a building in Edinburgh that was named after the great Scottish uh, philosopher, uh, David Hume, has been renamed because of a, a racist sentence that he wrote more or less en passant a quarter of a millennium ago, even though in general, he was a great uh, opponent of slavery. As Falstaff says, detraction will not suffer it. However honorable a man may try to be or believe himself to be, he will be remembered as dishonorable. 
And therefore, of course, it's not worth trying to be honorable in the first place. That is uh, full staff's argument. At the same time, we know perfectly well that full staff is not criticizing honor as a concept or as a guide to conduct in an objective or disinterested way. Instead, he is excusing himself because he knows he doesn't have it within himself to be honorable. Surely all of us are familiar with this kind of rationalization. We don't give money to a beggar in, in the street, for example, because giving him something is not an answer to poverty or because the beggar will waste the money uh, on drink or drugs or whatever. Therefore, we don't give the, uh, the, uh, the money, uh, mainly because we don't really want to. Does Falstaff fool himself with his own reasoning? Well, yes and no. He knows that if he were an honorable man, honor being a virtue, he would need no catechism to prove that honor is worthless. The 18th century critic of Shakespeare, a lawyer called Maurice Morgan, wrote a book titled An Essay on the Dramatic Character of Sir John Falstaff, in which he claimed that contrary to the general opinion, Falstaff was not a coward in his and in his diatribe against honor, he was justified and speaking the truth. Interestingly, this is now being taught in schools and the obvious fact that uh, Falstaff's diatribe is a rationalization rather than an honest argument is over, uh, completely overlooked. And Shakespeare incidentally uh, devotes another play, the tragedy Coriolanus, to demonstrating uh, the opposite, the dangers of an excess attachment to the concept of honor. In other words, that a virtue carried too far becomes the vice. And this uh, doesn't seem to be a very popular message uh, at the present time either. And I'll end with a meta-psychological point in Hamlet. Uh, the Prince of Denmark is a vacillating figure. His tendency to see all sides of a question inhibits his action and in the end lends to a far worse result than if he had been uh, uh, impulsive. His father has been killed by his brother Claudius, who then marries Hamlet's mother and usurps the throne, which rightly should have descended to Hamlet after his father's death. The usurping king Claudius is worried uh, by Hamlet's strange behavior and has good reason to be since Hamlet uh, is very, um, uh, very violently opposed to him. Claudius therefore sends Hamlet's univers university friend, <coughs> Guildenstern, to find out what is the matter with Hamlet and what is causing him to behave so strangely. In trying to find out, Guildenstern claims to be motivated by friendship towards Hamlet, but Hamlet guesses and is shrewd enough uh, to know that Guildenstern is actually a spy for King Claudius. There follows a memorable exchange between Hamlet and Guildenstern. Hamlet holds out a musical instrument, a pipe, um, a kind of recorder, uh, to Guildenstern and asks him to play on it. Guildenstern says that he can't, he cannot, and repeats on Hamlet's insistence several times that he just does not, does not know how uh, to play it. Whereupon Hamlet says, why look you now, why, now, why look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from the lowest note to the top of my compass. Do you think that I am easier to be played upon than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will. Though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. And here we return to the essential mystery of man and to the impossibility of man's achieving a full understanding of himself or others. At no point in the play does Hamlet claim to understand himself, though he is vastly more reflective than the great majority of mankind. He thinks about himself much more than uh, most people. This lack of understanding, however, has a fortunate corollary 
namely that no one else can understand him either. And therefore he is never fully manipulable by anybody. Full understanding of ourselves would mean an infinite capacity to manipulate others, which would be terrible. I'm glad to say, however, that I think we will never reach that point. And I doubt that we are any nearer to it than was Shakespeare, who likewise denied that it was possible. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I end on an optimistic note that we will never fully understand the mystery of our own existence. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I think everybody was able to, to read with you because I put uh, the sonnet and Hamlet and uh, all the other excerpts here. So everybody was able to, to read together. Great. Uh, Luis Felipe, would you like to start with the question or what would you like? Yes, thank you. Well, Dr. Daniel Stoney, uh, I would like to ask you a question from another piece of Shakespeare, Macbeth, okay? Uh, do you think that when Macbeth says that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, is he right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, he's, uh, he's right for himself in that particular situation, which he has created sure. for himself. Uh, but I don't think he's right for all of us. However, when he says that, we understand his despair uh, at, at the situation that he has created for himself. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a universal law of human existence. Okay, or in, thank or God. In, <laughs> thank goodness. And nor is it, in, <laughs> nor is it intended in that, uh, in that sense. I don't believe that that's, Shakespeare wants everyone to think that uh, uh, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying <laughs> nothing. I don't think he wants us all to go away thinking, oh, uh, now I know what life is all about. Um, <laughs> So yeah, because what, if, what if, he's doing is allowing us. Yeah, sorry. No, no, what I was going to say that if we don't understand ourselves, maybe we don't understand exactly what life is either. No, uh, well, uh, I think uh, the evidence suggests that we don't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> We have some questions. We have uh, uh, so many compliments. Uh, Tony saying, "Excellent! You were you are an inspiration. Wow! Uh, people are really really glad that you are here with us." So we have a couple of questions. The question I'm going to ask you is about this book that wasn't translated into Portuguese, yes. Uh, yes. and uh, we highly recommend it because it's so, uh, it is people the terror of existence from Ecclesiastes to the Theater of the Absurd with uh, uh, Kenneth Francis as well. So my question is that when we see the list of the works that you selected to compose the terror of existence, you selected uh, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, Gulliver's Travels, uh, some examples, Chekhov, Waiting for Godot, and uh, Ionescu, of course, Hamlet, and uh, Matthew R knows the Dover's Beach. So how was the selection of this? How, how did you arrive at this book? Uh, well, uh, it was the, actually the idea of my co-author who, mm -hmm. um, who is a uh, strong Catholic. He's a, and, uh, um, uh, and we just thought of uh, works which we both uh, knew uh, or thought actually say something about these, these difficulties that people have in finding meaning in life and which illustrate how, how 
uh, how without a sense of meaning, uh, life is very, very difficult. Sure. Uh, there is a question but without, of course, sorry, without giving any answers. I mean, I, uh, I suppose uh, rel uh, religion is an answer to it, but it's not an answer that I can subscribe to. So um, it's not I'm not anti-religious. I'm just I'm not religious myself. Yes, we know. Uh, there is a question from Paulo. He says uh, he asks you, do you think that the flaws identified on your book, False Positive, uh, also affected in great measure recent COVID works? Uh, well, I think the, the problems are, <laughs> the problems are, no, I, I, I wouldn't say that actually. I, I mean, COVID is a very uh, difficult subject. Uh, uh, but much of the science is of a different kind from psychology. Um, the, I, I suppose you could say that the, uh, the difficulty is knowing what the correct response to COVID is. But the actual science of COVID uh, seems to me to be progressing uh, uh, very well. Okay. Let me check here. There are some more questions. People ask me here through WhatsApp, what is the great, uh, the, the most recent and greatest book that you have read so far this year, the last couple of months? Uh, uh, what shall I say? The greatest book. Oh, I'm not sure I've read any great books in the last Recently? two months. Uh, uh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it depends what you mean by great books. I have read, um, I'm writing at the moment, I'm trying to write mm -hmm. a book about uh, the lost writers, the forgotten writers of Père Lachaise. Père Lachaise okay. is a famous cemetery in Paris sure. yeah. in which many famous writers are buried. And it occurred to me when I was walking through Père Lachaise that if there are many famous writers uh, buried in Père Lachaise, there must be many writers who are not famous. In fact, many more writers who are not famous who are buried in Père Lachaise. And I thought it would be interesting to look at uh, the writers okay. who are not famous, uh, not Oscar Wilde, not sure. Proust and so on, or Balzac. And I found a, a, a woman writer actually, she was was a, um, uh, uh, she was a novelist, not a very good novelist, but she wrote one remarkable book, which is completely forgotten. I mean, no one reads it. Her husband during the First World was a doctor and he died during the First World War. And she wrote a book about the 1,600 French doctors who died during the First World War, who were killed or died during the First World War. And uh, she gathered material about many of them, not all of them. And it is the most remarkable uh, book. It's, um, uh, it tells us of a level of suffering of which we have, fortunately. No idea. No idea. And I can't imagine that. Uh, for, just to give you one little example, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a typhus epidemic in Serbia in, mm -hmm. I think it was 19... 1915, I think mean, it was 1915, which killed half the doctors in Serbia. And the uh, French authorities asked for uh, doctors uh, to go on a, a typhus commission uh, to Serbia, and they needed a hundred and three thousand volunteers to, to go to try and deal with an epidemic that had already killed half the medical profession of the country. Well, we... We, we have no idea. We, just, we have no idea of anything like that now. Anything like that. My God. Uh, uh, there is another question, for, and I was going to ask you about this book, So <laughs> yes. Little Done, and uh, the, Paulo, uh, who is a fan is here with us so he's asking before uh, uh, I, I picked the book but he's asking before so uh, he asks uh, Graham Underwood the, the serial killer here so little done 
reveals us lots of our underground truths. But uh, he asks, and there's the questions, but actually serial killers, can, can serial killers bring us some pearls of wisdom? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, in my experience. <laughs> um, uh, no, they can reveal things about our society. That they can do without, I mean, they don't intend to, that's not why they're doing it, but they can reveal things about our society. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, but the, 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 the image just froze, but, but just go on. Yeah, so they, they reveal things about society. So for example, there was one very notorious uh, serial killer in England who mm -hmm. used to prey upon young men um, and he would kill them and uh, then he would watch television with their bodies uh, next to him on the, on the sofa. And what was perhaps interesting is that 14, I think it was 14, maybe 15 people, young men, could just disappear from the, uh, from the city and no one, no one would notice. And, it, and he was caught only because he tried to uh, get rid of their bodies by flushing them down the drains. He cut them up and put them down the drains. Yeah. And that was why he was caught, not because anyone had noticed that these people were missing. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that reveal, if you like, that reveals something about our society, that there are actually quite a large number of people who would not be missed, who have no contact. Transparent, with. yeah, yeah, yes. Um, there are so, we are, we, well, it's three o'clock already, but uh, uh, there are so many, many quotes about the importance of literature and the importance of books in our lives. And I would just like to comment one and ask uh, something. There is a book that was recently published. I don't know if you've seen that. I think it's so beautiful. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, uh, by I haven't Michi seen it. it's by Michiko uh, Kakutani. She was the, the, the editor, I think, New York Books Review or something, a New yeah. Yorker. And uh, she said that I'm going to, to, to read and then I want your opinion about it because it's one of my favorites. So as I am here presenting, I'm going to say it's my favorite. So uh, she says, James Baldwin once said, you read something which you thought only happened to you and you discovered it happened 100 years ago to Dostoevsky. This is a very great liberation for the suffering, struggling person who always thinks that he is alone. This is why art is important. What do you think about it? Is it true for you as well? I think, it, yes, I think it's uh, true uh, for me, but I can't say that it's true for everybody because not everybody reads. Uh, and indeed, it's, it seems that, uh, I don't know, in Brazil, uh, uh, but fewer people, fewer young people seem to read uh, in my country and elsewhere. I don't know whether it's true in Brazil. Incidentally, I must tell you one interesting thing about Brazil. When I came before, uh, Brazil is the only country that uh, where the majority of the people who are interested in my uh, books are young. Really? Everywhere else, they are old, yes. Which is, very pleasing, which is very pleasing to me, because obviously it's more important that young people should read them than old people. I mean, I'm only telling old people what they already know. <laughs> so, uh, so, so uh, but Brazil is the only country uh, where this is true. Fantastic. I think uh, uh, here, that I know. Yes, here in our lab, there are many research groups that have been over your books. And I can tell you that there are our audience or our researchers are from like 18 years old to 80 years old. So you have the whole spectrum here with us. Yeah. But so, one site was in South Park. 
once I was in Sao Paulo and the uh, yeah. university, I've forgotten which uh, university, but anyway, uh, there was quite a big audience, maybe four or 500 people. And, um, and they were mainly young. And uh, that, that has never happened to be before. Most, mostly my audience is not that I speak, I speak very much in public, but my audiences are usually of about the average age is 90. And about two thirds of them have hearing aids and go to sleep. Of a two they do not quite listen. They are your audience, but they do not quite listen to it as as well. So maybe. <laughs> but I think that I know whose fault is this is uh, Luis Felipe's fault because he. Uh, uh, I know he says to his students to read your books and he has graduate students, so it's his fault. You can talk to him, that he's the responsible for that. Well, I think it's very good. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's very good. Yeah, we can, uh, Luis, uh, Pondé, would you like to, to, to say something? Or then we can unfortunately end this? Well, uh, I just want to thank Tony once more. And that's true. I taught one of your books, two of your books in my PhD classes at the university some years ago, before you became famous here in Brazil. It was a pleasure. Okay. Uh, uh, it was my, it was, I, I was taking the PhD and we had one semester with life at the bottom. Yes, exactly. Life yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. It, so we are yes we are, yeah it was a fantastic ex experience. Real great. One of, yeah, one of the best things that happened to me in uh, Sao Paulo was after I talked, a young man and his wife came up to me and said that he had grown up in the favelas. He so obviously he came from a poor uh, family. Uh, and he said that what I described was what he saw himself around him when he was growing up. And that pleased me uh, a great deal because, of course, uh, I mean, I didn't please, I'm not happy that. Yeah, sure. sure. Is, but, uh, yeah, it's universal. I, yeah. 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 It pleased you because you got it right. That's what you mean. You understood how things were. Of course. Yes. And yes. also, I mean, that, uh, of course, this, ma this young man, who was obviously very impressive, had managed to escape. Sure. sure. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 And, and, and talk to you and it, fantastic experience. Um, can we invite him to come here again? Andrea, can you ask him to come again, please? <laughs> yes, yes. These are some of the comments that people are writing. Yes, Chris. Yes, so uh, Tony, everybody's talking about incredible, what a delicious opportunity to listen to you. Definitely Ponda is to blame. It was wonderful, <laughs> thank you, sensational. So there are many things in Portuguese that I'm translating. Excellent, you are an inspiration and many other things. So I thank you so much. We hope that next time maybe you can come to Sao Paulo and meet us in person. Yes, well, Eat if pizza ever again. that is possible again. <laughs> <laughs> and eat pizza and have fun. Yeah. Well, thank sure you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gente, thank muito, you, muito, muito obrigada pela participação de todos. Uh, continuamos aqui no Labo e hoje voltem às 5 horas porque temos o lançamento da revista Laboratório. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Daniels. Thank you, Pondé. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Tony. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.